Sounds good. All right, well, welcome everyone to the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources uh, Fall 2019 webinar on copyright and licensing with OER. I'm Matthew Bloom. I'm the OER coordinator at the Maricopa County Community College District in the Phoenix, Arizona area. And I'm also one of the vice presidents for professional development with CCC OER. And I'll be moderating a panel discussion today. So I will introduce our panelists um, and then we will talk a little bit very briefly about who we are at the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. And then Jenrin Wetzler from Creative Commons will provide a flash review of the different Creative Commons licenses. And then we'll have a panel discussion, which we hope to be somewhat interesting and avoiding some of the um, too complicated discussions, but actually at the same time engaging in some of the nuances of the Creative Commons licenses and how they work with um, all the work that we're doing for um, open education at our different institutions. Um, just as a reminder, you will have the opportunity to ask some questions. Hopefully we'll have some time at the end. Uh, if you do have some questions, feel free to enter them into the chat window. Um, I cannot guarantee that we'll get to them all, but hopefully we'll have some time uh, at the end for that. And um, past that, we'll talk about um, a few resources that you have and ways that you can stay in contact with us. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to our speakers for today uh, to introduce themselves. Annalie, would you like to start? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Annalie Mon Perry. I'm a scholarly communication librarian at Arizona State University, which means that I specialize in scholarly publishing, copyright, fair use, and all things open. Thank you. And Kelsey? Hi, I'm Kelsey Smith. I am the Open Educational Resource Librarian at West Hills College in Lemoore. And uh, since most people don't know where Lemoore is, it's sort of in the middle of nowhere, California, about 30 miles south of Fresno, so uh, Central Valley. Um, my job, um, sort of my daily duties are working individually with faculty and in groups. Um, I work exclusively with OER and I don't really do a lot of that normal librarian type stuff. Um, and most of my job involves searching for OER. Great, thank you. And Jenrin? Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I am the Assistant Director of Open Education at Creative Commons and um, love connecting with, with folks who have run through the, the CC certificate course. I know some of you are, are here um, and also working with a lot of you who are um, in the audience. So it's just, it's an honor to be here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think that we have a lot of interest in this webinar today because hearing from a few experts about the kind of the nuances, the intricacies of Creative Commons licensing is a very popular topic. We found, um, you know, a lot of interest in it. So it seems like it's going to be uh, pretty um, pretty engaging. So first of all, like I said, um, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. A lot of you have already done that. Um, we have, last time I looked, we had almost 90 people um, logged in right now to the webinar, but feel free to introduce yourself. And like I said, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and put them into the chat window and we'll try to either incorporate that into the discussion as we go or have a little bit of time at the end if we have that opportunity. And just as a reminder, if uh, some of you are perhaps new to um, the CCC OER webinars, the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources is, um, is, a, is a subgroup of the uh, Global Open Education Consortium. And our goals are to expand awareness and access to high quality OER, um, support faculty choice and faculty development, um, and also provide some you know, regional leadership for open education, all of course with the goal of improving student success. And we have been doing webinars for several years now. Um, they are archived on our website. You can go check out uh, webinars going all the way back to, if I remember correctly, I think 2012. So there's quite a bit of um, interesting discussions and great resources that you can find on the website there. 
And we also have memberships from all across um, uh, the United States. We have uh, several new members here and maybe some uh, representatives from those uh, institutions uh, might be on the webinar today. So congratulations to the new members and thank you for joining with us. And if you are interested in more details about CCC OER or about how to become a member, you can always uh, check out our website to find out that information. So without further ado, I will go ahead and turn this over to Jenren Wetzler, uh, who will provide us with a little bit of an overview on the basics of Creative Commons, uh, the difference between all rights reserved and some rights reserved for those of us in the audience who may need a, a refresher on those basics or may be uh, very new to Creative Commons licensing. So Jenren, take it away. Thanks so much. Well, first, I want to recognize that there are plenty of people in the audience who also have far more expertise than I do. Um, so if anybody has questions about what I'm saying or any revisions to what I'm saying, please feel free to, to type that in the chat space. So um, simply put, we're in an information abundant era, as Cable Green also in the, the audience um, likes to say. Um, what that means is we um, we have this really incredible moment in time where we, um, our landscape for information sharing has, has changed with internet. And what that means is online uh, connectivity has broken down the traditional barriers of geography, of our time and access that's traditionally kind of stunted our communication flows. Um, but copyright or laws that grant exclusive rights to creators over their creations was built for the printing press and the information system that existed in that era of the printing press. So copyright was a way to incentivize creators despite the intensive labor, the expensive and limited print copies that were available in that era. And I'm actually, I'm going to pause right there and copy and paste a pretty good definition of copyright with a caveat in the chat space in case anybody wants a little bit more information. All right. I'm not sure if that piece it. Okay. So we now have this opportunity to share works far more easily um, and at near zero cost online and scale the number of people reached with these works um, far more easily. But our current copyright system has not adapted. Um, beyond that kind of lack of adaptation, we're seeing other restrictions to um, this copyright system. So we see um, increased prices for um, published textbooks, um, the rise of subscription um, prices for publications. And not only um, are there increased costs, but there's also an increased amount of time that um, works remain under copyright. So in the 1990s, the US, for example, extended um, the copyright protections over works from um, life of the author plus 50 years to life of the author plus 70 years, which means it's almost, at times, it takes almost two lifetimes to access the really wonderful resources that could be at our fingertips for reuse, for innovation, and for learning. Um, so I think this presents us with a, a pretty significant challenge. And many, many people recognize that there is, um, that these restrictions, despite the ease of information sharing in this current era, is um, untenable. So there are a number of different ways to address this challenge, and I would argue that some ways are a little bit um, more effective than others. And I want to pause there and just recognize the difference between um, one set of ways versus another that might seem more similar on the surface. A lot of times people will hear about um, free resources, and they'll also hear about open resources, open educational resources, open access to information, and so on. But these are actually two very different terms that have very different connotations. So free, for example, might sound really good, um, but oftentimes in this, this kind of ecosystem, it masks the transfer of costs from incurred within this kind of traditional copyright system, incurred by um, one party, that are kind of transferred to another party. So an example of that would be when students get um, access to free 
um, textbooks um, or um, academic journals. Um, this is not actually free because uh, universities actually pay for subscription bundles to these academic journals and they ultimately get their funds for, for this from tuition, from students. So this is an example of how free is not exactly what we're looking for when we're, we're looking at um, open. Um, open, on the other hand, refers to unfettered access or access to resources and formats that allow for free download, ad adaptation and imp improvements. Um, it, it also refers to uh, no time restrictions um, in accessing those resources either. So open is completely different from free, but it's often kind of mistaken for, for free at times. <clears throat> or freeze mistaken for open. So how do we actually open access to resources? Um, this is where the CC licenses um, come into play. And I will recognize that there are other licenses that are open licenses, but um, Creative Commons has the, um, the global standard for um, these open licenses that are also interoperable. So with open licenses, right off the bat, Creators can execute their own rights and grant permissions to other, others that want to access their works. They can provide unfettered access or retain certain rights as needed. So CC licenses are kind of considered some rights reserved as opposed to the all rights reserved of copyright licenses. So I think um, on my screen, I'm seeing um, Matt Bloom's contact information, but I, I expect everyone else is able to see the, the CC uh, licenses here. I'll just spend a moment to give a quick overview about the CC licenses. And if anybody is curious about learning more, I'm happy to follow up after this, um, this discussion. Okay, so there are six different licenses that Creative Commons affords. These are um, all contingent on four basic license elements. And so you can see that there are kind of four icons here that are kind of mixed together. So our first element is the CC BY element or attribution element that is common on all of the licenses. It basically means that um, you can use an open licensed work as long as you give attribution to the licensor, generally the creator, but sometimes it's, it's different. So that attribution element is kind of at the core of all of these licenses. Um, you also have a share alike or SA icon, and it's the, the little arrow circle. Um, this references um, our ability to work with open license works and um, use them, but the requirement to share um, share works with a, a the same or comparable license. So you cannot, for example, add on additional restrictions to a work with a share alike license. Um, as you remix it. Um, we also have our non-commercial element, which means you cannot um, use an open licensed work with this non-commercial icon um, for commercial purposes. And I think we'll probably get into that a little bit more in the, the discussion um, later on. And then finally, we have the, the no derivatives element. And this means that um, you are entitled to use the work that is openly licensed with a no derivatives um, clause, but you cannot um, share any adaptations of that publicly. So while you may be able to make an adaptation of say a play or an image for your own personal use, you cannot share that personal use um, because it, it changes the license. So these are the four elements that undergird the six different license options or the six ways to um, provide permissions for downstream users of open licensed works. So when creators want to determine what they want their, their works to, um, how they want their works to be used, they can select one of these six licenses. And you can actually learn more about which license may um, be most suitable for you with our CC license chooser, and I'll get a link for that and post in the chat space. Here it is. Okay, so if we can go to the next slide, um, here you'll see the um, 
the kind of the sliding scale of open. So this is a demonstration of how our licenses can roam from um, very open, unfettered access to much more limited access to eventually you get to all rights reserved access um, or all rights reserved um, copyright at the bottom. I will make a, a note that at the top you see our public domain um, tools or our icons for public domain dedications. These are technically not licenses because um, the public domain is the kind of the vast pool of human knowledge that exists um, outside of the restrictions of copyright. So these are considered tools. The rest of the six licenses that you see are, um, they work in copyright. So they work with those restrictions. So here you see um, those licenses going from um, CC BY to the very most restrictive license at the bottom to copyright. Um, I'm realizing in terms of timing, I, I'll stop there, but happy to answer any questions about the licenses and how to use them um, during the, the discussion and, and following the discussion. Well, Thanks that's so great. Much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jen. I think that that is uh, extremely helpful because, like I said, we have uh, maybe some people on the call who are experts uh, at Creative Commons licensing, uh, far surpassing whatever you know small amount of expertise I might have. <laughs> um, and then there are also maybe some folks who really need the the kind of reminder about some of the basics. And that actually brings me to um, one of my first questions, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. I just want to say that um, one of the kind of basic requirements of all of the six Creative Commons licenses, or actually the basic requirement is the need for attribution. And I'm sure that a lot of us over the, the course of the next you know, 45 minutes or 40 minutes will uh, probably have questions about how to attribute and what's, what are the best practices for that. And we decided uh, to actually just provide you with a set of resources for uh, you know, best practices for attribution, how to build the attribution itself, some tools for that. And so there's a slide later on uh, that is dedicated to some of these resources for attribution, although feel free to share specific questions in the chat window. Um, I did want to start the panel discussion, um, at, you know, after kind of having this this primer uh, focused on um, all, you know, the basics of copyright and the need for open licensing and, and how the, the open licenses work along with existing copyright law. I felt like it would be a good idea to start with a very basic question, or I guess suite of questions, focused on this really, I think, um, interesting word work. So um, again, I, I almost, I just want to say, I almost put a slide in this presentation with like a picture of like a bunch of lawyers in a room to say like, you know, just to kind of like preface the whole thing um, and saying like, we are not lawyers, right? Nobody on this, uh, at least to my knowledge, nobody on, uh, participating in this webinar uh, is a lawyer. So, you, you know, it's it's all prefaced with that kind of caveat that, that these are just kind of opinions about how... Um, how the licenses work, but it would nonetheless, I think, be very valuable for us to draw from our experiences and for you specifically on, on the panel, to draw from your experiences working with OER, working with faculty at your institutions or with other organizations, um, working with people who are, uh, or thinking about the experiences that you've had with the open licensing and just give us a general sense. And, and I'll just leave this open to whoever kind of wants to jump in and respond, but what do we mean when we talk about work like what is a work um, and then I've also heard other terms collective work I've heard obviously derivative work uh, is something we'll be talking about so wondering if uh, someone on the panel would be interested in kind of providing um, a, a, an answer or a set of answers to these questions here sure I'll go ahead and jump in um, since copyrights one of my uh, one of my hobbies, I suppose. You're absolutely right. I'm not a lawyer. Um, so when we look at works for copyright, we look at things that can be protected by copyright. And these are often things that are original works of authorship that can be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And this can cover a lot of different types of things. Um, a lot of the things that we normally think about in education, such as textbooks, learning objects, videos, slide decks, um, and other sorts of things. But there are some things that under that might not be protected by copyright that we might still consider a work. So certain types of facts and data may not be protected by copyright or 
procedures or processes. Now, they might be protected by a different type of intellectual property, but they're not protected by copyright. Um, so, you know, works can be a whole bunch of different types of things, and some can be larger works, some can be smaller works. Sometimes it could just be like a brief essay. Sometimes it can be an entire documentary, right? So there's lots of different sizes here. Uh, when we look at a collective work, that is often a group of different types of works that have been pulled together, and they may be authored by a bunch of different people, um, or they may be group authored, where there's a bunch of people working together to make kind of a unified whole, as opposed to pulling together a bunch of different kinds of works that are authored by different people, not necessarily intending for it to be um, put together and mixed up into one cohesive bit. Um, a derivative work is something specifically mentioned in copyright law as something is one of the exclusive rights of a copyright holder. And that is building from one, you know, starting with one type of work and building to another type. So a really good example would be I have a, uh, a work that I created and I want to translate it to another language. So that would be, um, that would be a derivative work. Or perhaps I am starting with a, uh, a lecture that I've presented and I have a bunch of maybe a slide deck, but now I want to take that slide deck and make it into an interactive tutorial. That would be a derivative work as well. Um, so I'll start there and see if any of the other panelists want to jump in. I don't think I could have said it any better than that. Um, I just wanted to add on another example of what a collective work is and one that I see very often at the uh, community college level. Um, our faculty often um, compile a lot of OER on our LMS, which is Canvas. And so that would be considered a collective work. So they may apply a CC license to their whole course, but there are so many different OER, are like compiled into that. So they may have videos, images, text, all of that organized into an online course. So that would be an example of a collective work. And I don't have anything else to add to that. I think the, um, the one kind of side note, um, in terms of derivatives, we also sometimes refer to them as remixes or adaptations. So if you hear people talking about derivatives or remixes or adaptations, they at least in, in my context, we use them interchangeably. That's great. Thank you so much. Now, there are, there are a couple questions, um, a thread of, of kind of questions going on in the chat window right now that I think would be definitely appropriate to expand on this a little bit. Um, it was brought up. Uh, the, the point I think believe it was Buddy Muse said to copyright uh, to be copyrighted the work must be in tangible form as well um, and then uh, the response from um, Andrea Trunc uh, Truncoso was what counts as tangible obviously it can't simply mean physical otherwise everything would uh, digital would be open so would someone on the panel like to maybe address this question what do we mean when we talk about a work being in a fixed form or in a tangible form um, can we just kind of flesh out that definition just a little bit Sure. So we usually mean when we say fixed in a tangible form of expression, it means that it has to be saved and in a format that can then be accessed later. So um, if I take a picture with my phone and it's on my phone, that counts as a tangible form of expression. If I save a document on my computer or uh, in the cloud somewhere, that also counts. So it's really that it has to be able to be preserved in some way that when you you can come back to it at a later date you can share it with other people and it will still exist in that kind of state that it was in when you saved it right excellent I think that's very helpful um, I, it also occurs to me that that it, we may end up addressing at some point in this discussion a definition of what like what does it mean to publish or share something too uh, because it could just very well be that you, so, and, and it, maybe I'll just ask the panel this right now, if I were to create a document on my computer, uh, you know, and, and without the intention of ever sharing it, um, I would still uh, own the copyright automatically for that work, correct? Yes, in the U.S., yep. Yeah. 
So one of the questions that we had following up to this, uh, when we talk about a collective work or a derivative work, I want to thank um, Nate Angel actually for his. Um, I, I, some of us on on uh, participating here in this webinar may be familiar with this analogy um, that he's shared uh, about remixing, comparing the different ways that you can either uh, curate. Creative Commons license works in a way like this. This would be like the tray would be kind of the collective work, and then you know the, the individual compartments on the tray are the various you know I, I guess ingredients in the meal, but they have their different licenses, and you can clearly distinguish one from the other because you've got very solid boundaries there. Um, the comparison between this kind of curation of openly licensed materials with uh, what he calls the the CC smoothie, um, wherein you know it's the remix process, you know, putting it in the blender, basically, right? You're creating this lumpy paste, and it, it's it's virtually impossible at that point to tell where the strawberry ends and the banana begins. And so, thus, in this smoothie, the ingredient with the most restrictive license tends to overpower the beverage. Um, I, I think my question here because um, I found this to be a very helpful analogy. Uh, but my question is, is the distinction always that clear? Uh, are there situations where the blender maybe has only been you know, pulsed like once or twice and there's big chunks of you know, apple or something in there? Or is, or is any blending at all going to require the application of the more restrictive license? And, and another way to ask that question would be just in general, you know, where do we draw the line between curation of works and the creation of a remix or a derivative work? I'm happy to jump in with a first stab. So this is actually a really challenging question that comes up a lot in our certificate course on open licensing at Creative Commons. And um, it's not always clear. I think there are, there are a lot of cases where it's hard to determine originality. And a lot of times um, what constitutes um, originality actually depends on um, a country's applicable law. So I, I'm going to post a a link to um, a little bit more information on that if you're curious. Um, I would say because the, the lines can be blurry in our course, we end up emphasizing um, attribution first and foremost. So if you, if you do a good job attributing the content, then it's almost, it's almost secondary whether the content is collection content or remix content. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying it, it can be very difficult to determine. Um, I, I, I was just going to, oh, go ahead. You go. Okay. I'm just going to say that um, there was, there is no clear line and nobody really likes a chunky smoothie. Like we want it to be either a smoothie or a uh, TV dinner. And, um, and like you said, you know, no matter what, you will have to attribute every one of those ingredients that you are using. Um, so it's really, it's so situation dependent. It's, it's pretty difficult to answer. Um, so go ahead, Emily. I was just going to say that, you know, a lot of these questions are a copyright you know, everybody who loves copyright, we always have the same answer to most questions is it depends. So it's so hard to determine, like, how far is it? Like, if I take a work um, that is perhaps like a meme, right? I have a picture and I have some images on it. And maybe I want to use or uh, some words on it. And I want to use it in a different presentation. And maybe, but I want to change the word. How much of a change is that? Like how key are the, the words to that image? And that's a hard thing to determine. Like I might argue, well, it's not that big of a change. Maybe I'm changing one word. Maybe it doesn't really count as a full derivative or adaptation. It's just a really minor change. But I think that Jenren's point to being really clear in your attribution and articulating what you did change. So that's kind of the key piece, right? Yes, I use this. Here's where it came from. Only my version had a different word here. Um, so that nobody kind of mixes up what I'm doing versus what I took it from. Okay, well, thank you very much. I mean, so again, it's maybe not always the most satisfying thing to, to hear that uh, it, the answer is it depends, but it's just true. And I, and I appreciate that very much. Um, 
I would like to shift a little bit to a question about fair use and how fair use, this, this concept of defending your, I guess, violation of somebody else's intellectual property rights as, as fair use or fair dealing, how does that work with uh, Creative Commons licensing? So for example, if I were to, um, you know, it, well, let me just ask like this, is it possible to apply a Creative Commons license to a work in which you are fairly using uh, all rights reserved content? Um, because I have, I, for one, and um, I know some other people as well, but I know that I found myself at, at one point under the impression that Creative Commons licenses and fair use defenses, you know, didn't, didn't really work together. Like if you're going to put a Creative Commons license on something, then you, can, you shouldn't be like, you know, fairly using um, that work. Although I have been corrected in that, um, <laughs> in that misinterpretation of it. So I'm just wondering what, um, you know, is it possible to apply that kind of a Creative Commons license to a work where you're fairly using something? And if so, what considerations are necessary? Um, I like the answer to this would be a yes, but um, so if you are using um, depending on fair use for a few things within a work, maybe a collection, um, you can apply a Creative Commons license to that, but um, you need to be very clear in what is being used fairly. So um, you need to be clear on if you are using something that's protected under all rights reserved copyright that you make that distinction that your Creative Commons license does not apply to that section. Um, this I never encourage this among faculty that I work with. Um, if they are using uh, diagrams or videos in their course that they want to share out openly, that they then replace those with hyperlinks um, before sharing out. Um, there is also a no to this question. If you are using a like a whole PDF poem um, in your course that is all rights reserved copyright and you're relying on fair use, you cannot apply a Creative Commons to something that you don't own uh, the copyright to. So a no and a yes, but. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I really love to highlight. So one thing to really consider is that um, traditional publishers rely on fair use all the time for commercial uses, right? And we have big studios, we have textbooks, they use uh, rely on fair use. And so there's really nothing that prevents us from doing so with uh, Creative Commons and open education content. Um, I really appreciated um, um, Kelsey's comment about making sure that you make it clear that this content, this copyrighted content is excluded from our uh, open license. And then there's a really great um, code of best practice in fair use for open courseware that came out in 2009. I'm going to post the link to that here in the chat. Um, and this specifically addresses, um, these codes of fair use can really provide great guidance for common situations in open um, situations and, or so it provides good guidance for these different best practices and situations. So you'll see that this is a common situation that happens in this environment and here's how fair use can apply um, if your situation is very similar to this this fair use argument may work as well for you. So even though you always have to do your own fair use uh, justification for your use, because things can be different, um, there's always little individual changes, but these codes of best practice can provide a lot of guidance. Thanks, I'm looking forward to seeing that um, resource myself. Um, yeah, I think the one thing that I wanted to reiterate is that Creative Commons licenses do not replace other copyright licenses and fair use is a limitation to copyright. So, um, I I don't I don't see fair use as um, a good bad fellow or a bad fellow bad bad fellow. <laughs> um, I think they're two separate things. Creative Commons licenses and copyright can be restricted or can um, have the limitation of fair use. Excellent. I think that um, those are great responses. And again, you know, highlighting some of the complexity here, but also I think helping to clarify maybe some misperceptions that that might be out there. Um, I do have a question about other kinds of open content licenses. Um, 
I guess just just to ask the question directly, should we be remixing Creative Commons licensed content with work made available under other open licenses or even work that has been published with a non-standard permission statement as um, you know, we, we probably have all seen at one time or another, for example, an educator maybe before Creative Commons existed, you know, somebody might have created a website, you know, a teaching blog or something and, and put content on that and then down at the bottom just written in very much non lawyer language, um, something along the lines of well, feel free to use this as long as you're doing it for x and y and not blah, blah, blah. So I'm just wondering what, um, you know, should we be remixing content like that? Um, and if so, what should we consider? I'm happy to jump in with a quick thought on this. Um, so I think when you are trying to look at the interoperability of copyright permissions, you need a copyright lawyer. So if you are going to try to remix or if you're trying to kind of merge these permissions, um, it's going to get very messy, especially for lay people um, like us. Um, so I, I would argue that it's, it's not a good idea. Um, I think a, a really good thing about the Creative Commons licenses is um, they are interoperable. You don't have to initiate a legal conversation with a lawyer every time you need to use or remix them. I, I can definitely see some hesitation and I think that um, that's absolutely right. But I guess I would also argue two, two quick things is that um, for one thing, if, if somebody's kind of giving some permission in advance, even if it's not a standard license, but if they say pretty clearly on their blog or something like that, saying you're free to use this for this type of purpose, um, I think that it would be okay if you're using it for that kind of purpose. But again, you would want to make sure that you're clear in your attribution and your documentation that I'm using this by permission seen on this page. Um, and I would also say something like, and I guess the other thing is if you felt uncomfortable doing that, here's where it's fine to ask for permission. We can always do that. And if, and if you're looking at somebody's blog where they're giving that permission, then you're in, a, in an enviable place where you think that you know who the copyright owner is at that point. Um, and so you can always contact them and ask them for permission. Yeah, I was also going to mention that, and I've done that before, where I wasn't completely clear on what the person was allowing and not allowing. And uh, it, I know that's not always possible. Maybe the person doesn't work for wherever or they have passed away, but it doesn't hurt to reach out. And especially if you plan on mixing it with a lot of other Creative Commons license things, you can tell them what your intent is and if it matches with what they planned for their work. And, uh, yeah, so it doesn't hurt to reach out. Well, all right. I mean, so I think that, that I'm, that's great because at first it sounded like we shouldn't do it, but then at the same time, it, it, it really is a matter of um, the, the ability to contact the original author is, um, is a great potential recourse. And, and I guess as a follow-up question, if an author has, and again, I don't know if there's even really like a, a solid answer to this possible, but, and I know you're not lawyers, but um, if someone had published something in that way with a non-standard, you know, just expression of, of permission to use under certain circumstances, and then you reached out to them, is it appropriate and or possible to ask that person to release that content under an open license? Um, and if so, would it is is it not con, is it possible that the license that they apply could conflict with what they had written the non-standard uh, description before? Does that make sense? That makes sense to me. I I think it would um, like any other communication that you might have with um, a creator, getting a sense of what they what they intend is um it's definitely possible and if they're willing to apply a, a cc license um great i think if it it likely as conversation unfolds it, it could open up some conflicting um permissions but again that that's probably more um 
an indication that just additional communications needed rather than an indication of um, less communication needed, I guess, or shying away from it. Well, great. So one of the questions that I, I, whenever I do any kind of workshop about open educational resources or um, in a lot of discussions that I have with faculty, just as, you know, in the kind of support that I give in my job, um, one of the questions has to do with interpreting the non-commercial um, licenses. So the question that I have here, I think there might be some confusion sometimes about when a use is considered commercial. And I'm sure there's a lot of, there are a lot of resources out there to kind of help us look at case, case studies and things like that. But I'm wondering, um, you know, how do we draw the line between commercial and non-commercial use when working with bookstores or print on demand services? And, and I guess, and I know that this is kind of a nebula of questions here, but um, you know, what about some of these other, you know, case examples? What about the use of, you know, non-commercial content at uh, for-profit for -profit institutions or charter schools or when soliciting donations. Um, I was wondering if anyone could respond to these or maybe even provide a, a specific example where you have dealt with, um, you know, kind of working out one of, uh, you know, an issue related to the non-commercial clause. Um, I wanted to mention that, that the non-commercial license was actually purposely written sort of vague um, because it's so situation dependent and that line, there's no real solid line, it's pretty blurry. And um, so from my understanding, there's been some court cases and things about this. Um, with, as far as bookstores go, they, let's go, let's do print shops first. So a print shop, you are allowed to um, use a print on demand service. Uh, part of the Creative Commons license is giving you the ability to share and reproduce a work. And you sometimes cannot do that without a print shop. Um, so print shops are okay to use. That's not considered not, uh, commercial. Um, what you cannot do is then um, say your bookstore wants to print out an OER book that's non-commercial. They can't mark that up highly. Uh, they can mark up the price enough to um, do some cost recovery, but nothing more than that. And that's kind of been my understanding on the non-commercial in colleges. Um, and then I will let someone else take away the, uh, the second part of that question. I'm happy to jump in. Um, so I think the kind of a helpful distinction is um, also noting that you're looking at use, not the actual user. So the in if the intended use of the non-commercial um, licensed work ends up being commercial, then you're violating the license. If the intended purpose or use is, um, is um, a commercial venture for, say, a, a nonprofit, then you're violating the license. If the intended purpose is non-commercial, but it's being used at a um, at like IBM or another um, commercial venture, then you are not violating the the license. So it's really not about the the user; it's about the intended use of the license. I'm not sure if that made any sense, but um, I think you can you can have for-profit entities using non-commercial licensed um, works without infringing on the rights. Well, thank you very much for, for everyone for, um, you know, going and in, into some of this, uh, these philosophical discussions, or I guess some of the, the nuances, as I, as I keep saying about them. Um, this first set of questions that I had, uh, the questions we have addressed so far from what is a work to uh, the questions about remixing and fair use and everything, these were kind of all focused on drawing lines between definitions and, and kind of looking at, at some of those details. But I was also, there were, there's, there's a couple of, que well, one question in particular that um, has emerged in discussions that I've had with folks, you know, whether at you know, the Open Education Conference or, or, you know, various times where I've met with people who are trying to make these open education initiatives happen in higher education. And a question that 
comes up has to do with intellectual property policies. I mean, different institutions will inevitably have different policies regarding the intellectual property rights of content developed by their faculty uh, and staff. And so to your knowledge, how have some colleges dealt with issues or conflicts related to intellectual property policies? And I think that's, that's the part one of the question. Part two of the question is even more direct and it's, you know, should faculty and staff be releasing their work under Creative Commons licenses when no explicit OER policy language exists at their institution? I think this is a great question. Um, I know that I've been working with our Office of General Counsel to try to clarify our intellectual property policies uh, with respect to being able to apply Creative Commons licensed, Creative Commons licenses to our work. So I think in a, a key thing to consider is you should know what your what your intellectual property policy is. And I think everybody who wants to create their own work. Um, and apply a Creative Commons license to it needs to understand what types of their works where they own the copyright and which ones are considered a work for hire where their employer owns the copyright. And that's typically spelled out in either your employment contract or your institution's um, intellectual property policy. And often it's kind of there's some gray lines where they may say something like, well, your syllabus and lecture and course content and learning objects that you submit to your students, those are the work you do in the course and scope of your employment and that's your work for hire, we own the copyright to that. But if you do textbooks or you're doing scholarly publishing in your field, we like to encourage you to do that and so you own the copyright to those works. So, and sometimes that's a gray line. How do you draw a line between I'm making a, a textbook but I'm building it out of a bunch of modules that I created for my course. Um, so I think that, you know, the first you need to consider what it is. Um, and then secondly, if you want to release a creative, your work under Creative Commons license, often there's procedures where you could work with your department head, your dean, um, your office of general counsel and say, look, I know that what you really care about is that you don't want me to take my stuff with me when I go. So, I'm not going to do that. I just want to apply a Creative Commons license to it. Is there a process by which I can do that? Um, because I have to have the copyright in order to apply that license. Um, and so you, you have to clarify that process. But I wouldn't just slap it on there um, without having that conversation. And um, just from a perspective of a very small rural community college, um, and others out there, out there where the intellectual property policies aren't really written. Um, and if OER is new on your campus, there's probably no mention of open licensing in there. So um, at West Hills, we do have an administrative procedure that sort of mentions it, but nobody was really educated on it at the time. And it is going under revision. Um, and it did state that, you know, if you wanted to openly license something, it had to be CC by and then you know, faculty didn't really like that. So, um, but one thing I wanted to mention was um, it's a good idea to check if your state has some sort of policy. Um, our California Community College Chancellor's Office um, actually requires that anything funded by grants or uh, contracts out of the Chancellor's Office must be released under a CC BY license. So um, that would, you know, precede any of our language that we would have here on the college. So if the work an instructor did was uh, funded from the chancellor's office, it would need to be released under CC by license, you know, kind of no matter what was going on here at campus. So that's just something to be aware of. You may have a state policy and just sort of be aware where the, the funding is coming from. I have nothing to add on, on the second half of that question. I think you both um, covered it really well. Um, on the first part of your question, Matt, I, you were um, asking a little bit more about um, some institutions who have dealt with conflicts related to IP or um, maybe some examples that we could share. And um, I don't have many examples, but I, I did want to share a, um, a recent um, case that I was aware of that was um, pretty interesting. So basically there's been a, um, a legal case against Harvard for using images of slaves 
um, for commercial profit. And the, um, the lawsuit, and I'll post the article right here, um, the lawsuit says that the images are um, spoils of theft because the slaves in the images were unable to give consent. So the descendants of the slaves um, in the, the images have, um, may have rights to the IP. So um, anyway, a fascinating um, case. I, I know there are a number of different colleges that um, have similar challenges, but this, this one really came to the top of my mind. Thank you, that does sound very interesting. Um, I'm wondering if, so we're getting pretty close to the end here and I wanna leave about five minutes to um, go over the list of resources for attribution and some, um, some just other brief little details about how you can stay connected with CCC OER. Before we do that, um, the last question that I shared with, uh, with, every, with everyone on the panel or the last thing I was asking um, people to bring was maybe think about some kind of an experience that you've had a specific um, challenging or interesting experience that you've had working with open licenses so this is just very much open um, no pun intended in in terms of uh, you know your response but I'm wondering if anyone on the panel has uh, any you know experience that sticks out to you from your time dealing with uh, with the nuances of open licensing that you think uh, you'd like to share Happy to, to jump in. Um, so I think one of the challenging elements that I've seen in uh, my previous job was um, not, not particularly around the, the actions required for um, an open licensing requirement within federal grants. I was at the time um, at the State Department working on um, uh, federal grant requirements for open licenses. Um, so it wasn't the actual implementation or actions needed, but actually the the behavior change. So I think with likely with any behavior change, um, the biggest hurdle is often that kind of initial um, that initial mindset and um, addressing the underlying assumptions and mindset before change can happen. So um, we we found a lot of um, of different stakeholders that felt um, threatened by change and by what what loss it represented to them. So I think um, one of the the quotes I I really like is that change represents loss to to someone. Um, so it, I think what we found was um, after months and months of work, actually with cable and and other folks in the open community at the time. Um, we were getting nowhere with um, with kind of the resistance against our our work and kind of this this larger work that we were a part of um, creating a federal open licensing playbook, just a playbook, a, a set of guidelines for other federal stakeholders to understand how they could open license other cases of um, open licensing um, activity within the federal government and so on. Um, the resistance to that in particular was so um, so strong that um, the real takeaway for me was that um, much of the focus has to be on um, that kind of like empathy and um, acknowledgement of loss for stakeholders within a system or at least perceived loss that that they have so um, I'm not sure if that is clear but the the challenge for me anyway was more with the behavioral change and less with the, the actual open license. That part was easy. Yeah, I saw that a lot too. There's a lot of resistance from people because it's, it's a big change. And um, a lot of the challenge I had was sort of um, educating our faculty on what these licenses really are and they're not a threat, you know, and they always wanted to choose the most restrictive one. and. What's been interesting is seeing somebody who really had no interest or was open, openly licensing their work, but very restrictively, which they're, you know, they are free to do. Um, and then a few years later, seeing them dive real deep into OER and there, we have people trying to develop VR psychology, openly licensed stuff now. And there's just that whole transition on campus. Yeah, I guess, 
I think some of the biggest challenges is finding the tension between, um, you know, a lot of people that want to support open education or open access and want to make their content available and they want to make sure that people can use it and reuse it in different ways. But there is a definite concern by a lot of academics that, look, I want to make this out there, but I am concerned about um, commercial energies coming in and taking my work and then selling it and kind of ruining all this good contribution to the commons that I want to make. And the non-commercial you know, use does address that to some extent, but then it can also be limited, limiting in the kind of work. And same with the share alike. So sometimes it's that tension, like how do you pick the license that's going to best um, suit your intention for giving permission and access to your work? Well, thank you very much, all three of you on the panel uh, for participating in this discussion and, and sharing your thoughts. I think that um, so far, based on the, some of the other very interesting discussions going on in the chat, um, somebody just asked whether or not um, the, the, the full text of the chat will be shared. And um, I, I will leave it up to Una to determine that, but I think it would probably be fine. Um, and there, so there were some other discussions going on in there and some great questions and resources shared. So thank you, everyone everyone for participating. This has been, um, I think, very interesting, very enlightening in some ways. Um, as promised, here is a list of some OER and licensing resources. Specifically, there are a few in here. When you look at uh, the Creative Commons best practices for attribution, um, you can use the Open Washington Attribution Builder, uh, which is like a really nice tool um, uh, that you can use to kind of help you build the attributions if you need it. There's all kinds of great resources on this page here that we encourage you to check out and try to utilize. And finally, of course, or maybe not quite finally, but uh, remember that there's uh, conferences coming up from the Open Education Conference to the OEC Global Conference. Um, you can go to the website under Get Involved to see about those opportunities. And if you are not on the CCC OER community email, you do not have to be a member of CCC OER to join that email. Uh, and I will tell you that while you get maybe 15 to 20 extra emails a day, they are usually some of the most interesting emails you're likely to get. Uh, some really interesting discussions in the open education community take place um, on that listserv. So I do encourage you to join the community email to stay informed uh, and to uh, also you know, find out about new resources that, that folks are sharing on a regular basis there. And we also have our blog posts on the website as well if you want to check out some additional information about projects and experiences from folks in the open education community. And last, the shameless plug for the rest of our webinars in, the, in this fall series. Um, we've already done our two so far, the first two, but we've got one on October 16th about equity, diversity, and inclusion in OER. Um, following that in November with uh, a webinar focused on research studies, um, looking at the impact that OER has on various metrics. And then at the end of the semester, we thought because of all the great opportunities for um, conferences this, the, this fall, specifically the two that I mentioned, um, we will be focusing that final webinar on uh, kind, of, kind of doing a recap and, and providing some of our members a chance to reflect on their experiences and presentations at uh, those conferences. So we do encourage you to um, register early and join us for those. And if you have any additional questions, feel free to contact, well, according to this slide, not me, but feel free to contact me if you want. Um, Lisa Young and Tu uh, Asu Tashjian are the co-presidents of CCC OER. Uh, Una Daly is the director and um, Liz is a support specialist. And I thank you again for um, attending and have a great day.